thank you so much. When I got this invitation to talk about AI and happiness, it came with, please emphasize the happiness part. So I said, excellent, I look forward to that. And what we're going to talk about today is not what you're expecting. We are going to talk about, let's see, love and beauty and joy. Because these are the things that cause people to imagine and create. And AI is just a tool that helps the imaginal process. We think of AI as this extraordinary thing that's set to change our lives, but mainly the reaction to that I see around the world is fear, right? Most people have this idea, AI is going to replace my job. It's going to replace everybody else's job. What the heck am I going to do in this new world? But think of it a very different way. Think about it as a way to literally unleash incredible creativity. This is a world where all of your wildest dreams can actually be made to come true. We can hearken back, because this has been a dream for a very, very long time. There's a famous economist called John Maynard Keynes who was writing in the 1930s. And he wrote this amazing piece called A Letter to My Grandchildren. And it said, the technological innovations of our time are so big that you, my grandchildren, will only have to work 15 hours a week and have an amazing life. 15 hours a week? I know, everybody's laughing. <laughs> but if you think about it, we've had those innovations. Why aren't we only working 15 hours a week? Why are we in an office where we might feel not very comfortable talking about our wildest, most amazing creative ideas? Why haven't we accomplished what could have been done since 1930? It's partly a leadership problem. It's partly that we've had many decades of viewing leadership as a very top-down exercise, where the leader of organizations told everybody in the organizations which direction we were going to go and how we were going to do it. But leadership has changed because technology has changed. And now every one of you in this audience has a smartphone in your pocket that literally has more computational power than we needed to get a human onto the moon. You are so empowered compared to where we were in 1930. And this has changed the nature of leadership itself. So uh, leadership used to be all about the leader. Now it's really about the ship. How do you get the best out of the people who are on the team? How do you get the greatest creativity? Helen mentioned prediction is hard. Prediction is incredibly hard. Even when I worked in the White House, you know, everybody thinks you have a crystal ball once you get in there. I'm like, I checked every closet. There are no crystal balls here. You do not have any better sense of what is going to happen in the world just because you're sitting close to the President of the United States. But what it does teach you is preparedness is very valuable. So instead of trying to predict the future, how do we prepare for the future? Now, and usually you think, prepare for the external future, for what's outside of ourselves. But I'm going to argue to you that actually the place to begin is inside yourself. It's about deciding what makes your heart sing. What is exciting and interesting to you? And maybe the best example I can think of for this was a very interesting story of a young woman who in the late 1940s was 16 years old, an African-American woman, and at age 16, she becomes the first African-American to be hired to be a streetcar conductor in San Francisco, and the only female. When she was interviewed years later about how does this happen, she said, I just love the uniforms. 16. OK, cool. Now, it turns out this young 16-year-old happened to have poetry in her heart. 
And so she began to write. And she had an extraordinary career where she did many, many things. She became a political editor for some of the largest political uh, newspapers in Africa. She became a writer for Martin Luther King and for Malcolm X. At one point, it said that she was running a brothel. Uh, she wrote musicals that were on Broadway. She did so many things that you couldn't even describe it as a career path. There was no career path. She just followed her heart. That is the poet Maya Angelou. Now, I want you to think of all the people that you work with and look around at the people in this room. Every single person here and every other person who is not in this room, they all have some kind of song in their heart. They all have some interesting thing they would love to be doing. But where do they do it? Where do they tell people? Where do they think about it? So in this moment, I would really love if every one of you could just turn to your neighbor, introduce yourself, and maybe briefly describe not the song that is in your heart, but at least two reasons why you haven't pursued it. Could we just do that? Introduce yourself to your next door neighbor and two reasons you have not yet <laughs> pursued this amazing idea in your heart. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know, guys, but the vibe I'm getting is you guys have a lot of stuff in your heart that maybe we should talk about, that we should address, and give some airtime and some oxygen. <laughs> okay, can I bring you back? Can I bring you back? Can I bring you back? Now, if you had Maya Angelou working in your company, and you realize this woman has poetry in her heart. What would you do with that? Would you go, oh, that's very interesting. It's a cool hobby. Or would you put her in charge of corporate reports and corporate copy and suddenly produce language that the clients fell in love with? Because what's the most boring thing right now? Having to plow through corporate reports and so what are the gifts and the talents and the skills of the people around that aren't just cool, but actually could be deployed in an incredibly positive direction if we brought creative thinking to it? So here's a super interesting example that I love. Shell in the oil and gas industry had a problem, I think it must have been about 15 years ago, it was a problem with the wellhead and how to get the fluid to move through the wellhead better. It kept getting all blocked up and it was creating really expensive problems. They asked all of the oil and gas engineers, first in Shell and then in the industry, can you guys solve this thing? Nobody solved it. So they decided, OK, let's announce a prize. Let's announce a $1 million prize and crowdsource a solution to this thing. And so they put out the announcement, and you know who won? A tattoo artist. Now, why did a tattoo artist win a prize that all the oil and gas engineers in the world couldn't solve? Well, it turns out the way the ink moves through a tattoo pen solved the problem of how the oil had to move through the wellhead. So this is the kind of lateral thinking that we need to bring in a world where technology is enabling us on an extraordinary level. But it's no good if we're not being creative. Let me give you another example. Actually, it's one from lockdown and one that I particularly love. So in the United States, well, can I just ask in this audience, you guys know Americans are obsessed with cowboys, right? Right, OK. I don't know why we are, but anyway, we are. So there is a National Cowboy Museum. 
I, I don't know who's going there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I like this, we're in the Science Museum. Well, the National Cowboy Museum had lockdown like everybody else, and there was nobody to do the social media. And so they just thought, well, we just can't do social media during this period. And then this guy steps forward, who is literally the security guy who guards the museum. Um, and he says, I'm called Tim. I have never done social media. My daughters and my grandmothers, uh, granddaughters keep telling me I could, but I have to learn about these hashtags. And he says, but I love cowboys and the Cowboy Museum. And I know everything about John Wayne. I know everything about the history of cowboys. And please let me do the social media. So they gave him the social media. And the National Cowboy Museum went from having pretty much nobody following it to an explosion. As this guy goes on, he goes, you know, here's why this cowboy was a hero. Hashtag, my daughter says, right, hashtag. <laughs> I don't know why I'm putting a hashtag here, but hi, everybody. It's so authentic, it's so genuine, it's so heartfelt. Suddenly, everybody's like, I love the National Cowboy Museum, because they're giving this guy a chance to have what we all love, which is joy. They are expressing the love of a human's innate capability. And I think, as an economist, probably the most undervalued asset we have in the Economy is human capability. We underestimate what humans are capable of. Now, one reason we do this is because we've lived in an era that's very driven by science, and here we are in the Science Museum. And science has brought us miracles, there's no question about it. But science has also brought us a belief that the answers all lie with our analytical thinking and our analytical skills. But I would argue that the speed of change in technology today is happening so fast that analytical skills start to inhibit you, and what's really required is imagination. And almost nobody gets taught anymore how to be imaginative as an adult. We're like, leave that aside, kids do that. But we don't have ways to bring it into modern life. And so what I want to do in this talk is help you rebalance away from your logical, rational, analytical thought process, show me the data, to your imaginal, imaginary, creative thought process. And I love this quote from Mark Twain, where he says, you cannot depend on your eyes if the imagination is out of focus. And I think that's exactly right. So I'm going to talk to you about a concept uh, which is a word that I found because I love words and dictionaries. It's so nerdy, it's ridiculous. Since I was a kid, my parents gave me like this huge edition of the Oxford English Dictionary where you had to use um, a magnifying glass to read it. And I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's, it's worked out in my life. But <laughs> so here's a word that I found, cosmopoesis. No one has ever used this word in real life. It only exists in the dictionary. But what it is, it's the act of world building. So what are we doing all day long with the work that we're doing? We're building a company, we're building a community, we're building a family, we're building, I don't know, you're building something. Cosmopoesis is about building a world that others will not only occupy, but where they will become the person that they were meant to be. When you do cosmopoesis, you're doing what Tolkien did in his wonderful novels. You're creating a space where others can imagine and be creative. This is also true in the corporate world, right? Steve Jobs, when he was always asked, you know, what have you done with your career? He never said, we made computers. He, he was, in fact, emphatic. We are not in the business of making computers. We are in the business of creating a world where bright people never have to think about their computer. Think about that. Creating a world 
where I, I love Mac and Apple, where I never have to think about my computer. So now I can be creative. Nike, similar, right? You know the story of Nike, Phil Knight, it's a waffle iron, they're pouring rubber into the waffle iron in the kitchen. His wife is going, you're ruining my waffle iron, what are you guys doing? And why? Because he's a runner and he realizes maybe if we put rubber on the bottom of shoes in a waffle shape, maybe you can run faster, better, longer. Turns out, yes, you can. But did Nike create a shoe company? No. Nike created a world where a person who worked in a city in an office could become a weekend warrior. He created a world where you could be a hero, not for winning the races at the weekend, but for participating in them. That's what cosmopoesis is. That's what world building is. And what underpins world building is love. Now, you may say love. This is not a word I associate with my business life. But actually, it should be. And I would draw your attention to Peter Drucker, one of the most famous management gurus in history. And he did some work back in the 80s, trying to understand why do people work harder for volunteer organizations than they do for a job that pays them money? Answer, love. And he studied two different organizations. One was the Girl Scouts, and he just found people love this concept of scouts, and they will devote a huge amount of time and energy because they love that concept. And if you think that love as a concept, as a driver, is kind of a light idea, what drives special forces and militaries? The one thing that causes you to become a member of special forces is because you fundamentally care for the life of your colleague more than your own. It's literally they love each other on a level that they would sacrifice their own life for the other guy. So love is not some light concept. And by the way, I appreciate that I'm an American, so I can talk about love, and you're a British audience, and everyone's getting really uncomfortable, probably. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> And so now, I'm going to try another exercise with you. It's a yes-no exercise. And we're going to do this for literally two minutes. Try and turn to a different neighbor this time, and talk to that neighbor about all the reasons why somebody needs to invent parachutes for elephants. And I want the other person to say no. Just keep saying no, one, politely, however you want to say no. Let's do this, actually, let's only do it for one minute. For one minute, give most creative reasons why elephants need parachutes. Can we start? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm going to bring you back, I'm going to bring you back. <laughs> now you're having so much fun, I can't get you back. <laughs> Everyone come back, Everyone come back, bring you back to the center, and now I want you to do the same thing, other per switch sides, and the other person, I want you to say yes and. And what would you do on this Elephants with Parachutes? Everybody go. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> Can I bring you back to the center? Bring you back to the center. I love so much laughter in the room. And laughter is essential for what I am talking about, because if work is not fun, people won't do it as well. Fun is not optional. Fun is not optional. Now, my question to you is, when someone comes up with a very cool, wild, interesting idea, are you a no or are you a yes and? And if you're a no, can you become a yes and? Even if it's not going to go anywhere, just to play with that, because, again, as Helen said at the beginning, prediction is a terrible game. I can tell you as someone who's worked in financial markets, somebody who's worked in close proximity to the President of the United States, trying to predict the future, you are going to lose big time at some point. You might get lucky for a while, but basically it's a bad idea. Preparedness for a huge range of possible outcomes is a very wise use of time. In the world of politics, in the last decade, every single thing that people said that's impossible has happened, right? People are like, Trump will never win. Brexit will never happen. Like, lots of things we said were impossible have happened. So preparedness for the future is a key component of being able to grasp the new technology. And so I want us to kind of get into a state of mind. It's a state of mind where you see a beauty in possibility instead of residing in a certainty. Certainty is incredibly dangerous to technological innovation, and it's terrible for having fun. Terrible for having fun. So now I want to step you into what is happening in the world economy that you need to know about. All of the innovations that are occurring right now that are not just on the same scale as this science museum, but in my opinion, in my opinion it's exponential. What happened in the Industrial Revolution, which is a lot of what we have in this building, it is nothing compared to what is happening in the world economy today. So our capacity to adapt to change, to say to these people who are creating, not no, but yes and, is central to whether we're going to be successful in all of our endeavors. And you certainly can't be doing world creation if you don't have this more open-minded attitude. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about the new frontier of the world economy, which is space. Now, most people say, I have nothing to do with space. I'm never going to have anything to do with space. This is not about me. I'm going to show you why you're wrong. We are about to go back to the moon. Have any of you been watch watching this, following this? So some people are like, why are we bothering to go back into space? Is this just billionaires joyriding? I think the answer is no. The answer is we have discovered that we can solve many of the most difficult problems here on Earth by returning to space. Number one thing that we've discovered is the ability to put mirrors on satellites, catch the sun's rays, convert them into radio waves and beam them safely back to Earth in order to have power or electricity in any electrical grid anywhere in the world. Imagine what I'm saying. This idea is that you can have cheap, clean, green energy and not need hydrocarbons anymore just by putting mirrors on satellites, and beaming radio waves back to Earth. Now, this has already been proven by Caltech and by Airbus. So it's not even a hypothetical maybe anymore. This is being constructed now. And I know a whole bunch of people who are working on this today. Who is at the forefront of this? Turns out, the British. And in fact, I haven't updated this slide because Saudi has now agreed to back the British project that will test all this over the North Sea. Now, why are the Saudis interested in this? Because they've got oil and gas. 
answer because oil and gas may not be worth anything if you can have unlimited electricity anytime, anywhere, because of this new technology. It's a game changer for Earth. There's another game changer, nuclear fusion. You've probably seen some of the headlines about nuclear fusion. Most of the time, people say, well, yes, but that's 25 years away. And it's been 25 years away for a very long time, but not anymore. Now the success and the progress that's underway is so huge, we can see nuclear fusion is coming. And basically, that's not just harnessing the powers of the sun's rays, that's about building a star right here on Earth. Now, if you'd said that back in the 1930s or 40s when this idea first came up, if I'm a scientist and I say to you, I think I can build a star on Earth, what are you going to do? You're going to be like, this guy needs to be taken away, right? Well, we're building stars on Earth right now because that's what nuclear fusion is. So here we have a possibility of cheap, clean, infinite energy. That's a game changer. Now, we also have something new which sounds even more science fiction, which is space-based mining. So have any of you heard about Psyche and Bennu? OK, two asteroids you need to look at. Bennu, we just brought back this week samples. It's 200 million miles away. And NASA has brought back the samples and just opened the canister. And Psyche is said to be so valuable, it would literally be 700 times the value of the entire world economy each year. It has so much gold, lithium, cobalt, and all the things we need to make technology. That's a game changer. So NASA did this mission called the DART mission, where it was a very Hollywood headline. NASA can break up an asteroid to save Earth. OK, great. But that's not what it was about. NASA can break up an asteroid in order to harvest all these raw materials that we need to make modern technology. That means not ripping Earth up anymore. That's a game changer. Now there's a company called Alria, and Alria is a spin-off from Google, and what are they building? The first interplanetary internet. And you go, wait, but I don't know anybody to talk to on any other planets. <laughs> But that's because you're not taking into consideration that we are building the first factories in orbit that will be doing the refining of those metals that we retrieve from asteroids. And Varda is the first space factory which went up about two months ago. It's the beginning of many. The focus, in fact, on the moon and the, what they call cislunar space between here and the moon is so great that scientists are currently desperately trying to figure out how to assign a time zone to the moon. Because if you're going to do all these deliveries, right, humanity is going back to the moon, now we're going to be building. We're going to be building an oxygen grid, a power grid, manufacturing facilities, 3D printing. You have to have a time. But there is no time on the moon, and it doesn't rotate. So it's an interesting scientific problem. And to do all of this, you need an incredible amount of computational power, which is one reason governments everywhere are throwing huge amounts of money into supercomputers and quantum computers. Bristol, by the way, will be the center of Britain's quantum computing efforts, which will be world class. To give you an idea how important this is to all of us in this room, the fastest supercomputers in the world have been NVIDIA, uh, Summit and Sierra computers, which we keep at Oak Ridge in Tennessee, which is where we keep our nuclear capabilities. That's how valuable this is. But we gave these computers some incredibly complex problem, and it was concluded it would take 10,000 years for those computers to solve the problem, which was a miracle, because it would take humans never. Like, we'd never figure out that problem. But they could do it in 10,000 years. And then Google came up with their new supercomputer called Sycamore, and it can solve that same problem in 200 seconds. 200 seconds. So our capacity to problem solve is exploding. So any problem you can name, we are now going to be able to solve it. Not only that, but we can create new materials, right? In the past, you had to start with a piece of wood and shape it into something or 
fabric, turn it into something, right? We passed all these aircraft in the way, on the way in here. And so you're taking materials and shaping them into something new. Now we live in a world where you can start with an idea and build what you want, the material you need, atom by atom by atom. We will be creating new materials in a way that was unimaginable probably even 20 years ago. And everything I've described is a world where we won't need oil and gas the way we have, where we won't be ripping up Earth the way we have been, where we can pursue a green agenda in a way that's aligned with better outcomes. And at the heart of all this is artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence, again, I open saying most people are scared of it. But I think one way to think about it is now any one of you, in fact, any human being, can literally avoid having to pay expensive coders. You are literally now able to create a business, a website, a community. You can do all these things without needing to pay some coder a fortune. Now, of course, the coders are very upset about this, <laughs> right? So you hear the coders like, this is the end of the world. But you know what? These people are smart. They will figure out something else to do. But what's amazing, it's a huge unleashing of human creativity, because now you don't need to be a coder to create. Not only that, but the technology is changing to facilitate this as well. So computer chips, which we've made smaller and smaller and smaller so that they would fit in the phone in your pocket, now we've realized that the number of transactions that need to be done on a chip is actually increasing because the amount of data we have to manage is so much bigger. And so new computer chips are literally the size of a dinner plate. They're mainly designed for the metaverse. And more and more, I think the way we're going to be telling our stories is not going to be with a still image. It's not even going to be a 2D moving image. It's going to be immersive experiences. And so the metaverse will come into our world and we will come into it. The technology is facilitating that. So everything I've said now really demands that what we do is shift our whole mindset, which is going to be super hard, because you spent your entire life thinking about scarcity and how to overcome scarcity. And what I'm describing to you is a world where we could have abundant energy, abundant resources, abundant connectivity, an abundance of creative processes, AI that gives us abundance of access to new solutions that were never possible before. And what is this going to look like? Well, in part, it's going to look like individuals start to create without needing big organizations around them. And more and more big organizations are going to have to learn how to work with these highly creative individuals, because most of the new innovation is coming from little startups and small companies, usually with less than 50 people. So there's a big question, how do you interface with these more independent players who have more creative freedom, creative thought process? And with that, I want you to think about how many creative ideas have you had in the last 10 years that you threw away because it was too hard or it was too out there that now AI will allow you to do? Now, AI has a big problem, and it's a serious problem, and that is that AI optimizes really for two things, cost and efficiency. And on that basis, human beings are not very cost-effective, and we are not very efficient. What we're really good at is creativity. What we're really good at is novel ideas. What we're really good at is lateral thinking. Where do we do this kind of work? Do we do it at work? Anybody do their most creative work at work? Yeah, no hands go up. We do it when we're on a walk. We do it when we're in the shower. We do it when we're washing the dishes. We do it when we're relaxed. In a work environment, when we have a big problem, what does everybody want to do? Have a meeting. How many problems get solved in meetings? Not many. <laughs> 
how many problems get solved when everybody gets to go home and take the dog for a walk and they come back the next day, they go, you know, I've been thinking about it. I think I've got an idea. Humans need time in a way that AI doesn't. But humans do creativity in a way that AI doesn't. So there's a, there's a philosopher called Arthur Kessler. He was writing again in the 1930s and 40s. He wrote this amazing book, which I don't recommend you read because it's super heavy. So I'll just tell you, then you don't have to read it. Uh, it's called The Act of Creation. And he says in The Act of Creation, it's not enough to be really good at your subject, but you have to be really good at your subject to the point that you can riff, that you can like, do it without even thinking about it but you also need humor. And you also need to be in a relaxed state of mind. And when these three things come together, then creativity explodes. And so there's this wonderful story um, of the scientist who invented uh, penicillin, who went off in a huff, very irritated, and left his lab after a big argument left his lab all messy and dirty. He decided just to go on vacation and not clean it up. And he came back a week later, walks into his really messy, horrible office, and notices that half of the Petri dishes have a mold and the other half don't. And in that moment, he burst into laughter as he realizes, oh my gosh, I have discovered what became penicillin. And it happened because this person converted that bad situation into a humorful moment. Human, humor is not to be underestimated. Creativity is not to be underestimated. And that's why, if we're going to talk about AI, we have to talk about what it does not optimize for. It does not optimize for love. It does not optimize for human connection. It does not optimize for beauty and it does not optimize for joy. But I would argue that every human being is trying to get into a joyful, beautiful life and a joyful, beautiful set of solutions, if not create a world where others can experience more joy. And that is now facilitated by AI. So the answer to the question, is AI going to hurt us, is only if we let it only if we don't appreciate that what we bring to the table is as valuable or more so. That's about shifting from an analytical mindset that says, but AI is very efficient. Yeah, we're going to shift to an imaginal mindset where, yeah, but humans are very imaginative. So if we marry the two, I think that's where the future is. So I'll stop with that, and I think we're going to take some questions. Thank you. We do have 10 minutes for questions, uh, Q&A now. So if anyone has any questions, there are mics dotted around, people ready There's to run There's one right there. there. There you go. We have a mic. He's come. He's on his way. You can project, OK. And he's coming quickly, faster. Hurry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Pippa, that was amazing. Um, I'm just wondering, and hopefully this will resonate with a lot of the other L&D professionals in the room, when you're in a people-centric role, how can we incorporate AI technology into a business strategy without losing that human element? Well, I think this is the art form that you now have to develop. Um, it's this... It's your own understanding of what can AI do, but how can it bring out the creativity? So I guess my response is, if you had, a set, let's call it an 18-year-old Maya Angelou in front of you, and what you see on the resume is she's a streetcar conductor, wouldn't you like not to miss that moment and miss the fact that you've got one of the world's greatest writers right in front of you? So how will you find out what that person is made of? And it's a little bit, I know this sounds quite uh, out there, but it's, it's the practice of looking at every human being and saying, I know there's something divine in there. 
It may be very far in there. You may have to look really hard. But I think most people have some kind of divine spark. And even they may not be aware of what that gift is. And particularly in the realm of HR, part of the job is to discern these extraordinary gifts like unpolished gemstones and bring a little light to it. You know, maybe you're like the guy at the Cowboy Museum and we have you in security, but you really belong in social media. It's a way of thinking. Great, thank you so much. Oh, what's making this make all this noise? Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah, I'm just interested. So, yeah, we have technology that makes things faster and easier. So AI can do that. But what do humans do when they've got all this time on their hands? Because we're not that very good when we're not wired into stuff. So what's the risk of all this time on our hands? Well, I think that's why I mentioned the John Maynard Keynes. And let me elaborate a little. So what do we do with all the time savings that this technology gives us? Stay longer at work. What? What? And why? Partly because if you say, well, I'm going to go fill in the blank with something that isn't work, then you sound like you're skiving off, right? So, for example, I grew up surfing every summer. I love surfing, although I'm surfing aircraft now, so it's hard to go from planes to surfboards. But I miss surfing. I actually, I actually wear my surf beads to like, remind me, get on a surfboard again. It's not working so far, but I'm trying. But because I surfed as a kid, now when I talk about the world economy, I talk about it as this fluid moving thing. Most business leaders, they treat the world economy as if it's hiking up Mount Everest. They go, we have this goal. This is how much sales we want to have in six months or whatever the goal is. And then we just need the right people and the right equipment, and then we're going there. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, but it's not static because it's more like being in an ocean and the waves are rolling and, you know, the dark shadow coming towards you might be a dolphin, but it might be a shark. Like, it's a fluid environment, so you can't impose the we're going there very well. Um, so surfing has been very informative from how I think about the world economy and how I explain it. So who's to say whatever your hobby is, isn't equally useful? And so how much time do we spend with our colleagues saying, what do you do outside of work? And could I learn something from you? Could I pick up a new skill? I mean, honestly, now at my age, I look back, I realize, oh my gosh, a lot of the biggest business deals happened not in an office, not in a meeting room, but because somebody bonded over, I don't know, golf or bowling, or they hiked on, the, on a weekend together somewhere, or they share a love of a certain kind of art. It's human. So my answer is, if we don't take advantage of the time that artificial intelligence technology is giving us, that is our fault, and that is a problem. And the gifts you have can't come to light because you won't devote any attention to them. So that's why I say it's not just an external awareness, it's also an internal awareness. And the more aligned you are with those internal passions, the more authentic you will feel, the more people will trust you, the greater the chance that you end up being a leader yourself in the community and the company that you're working in. So AI is a gift to skive off. That's a takeaway. Okay. <laughs> we have more? Down here. The lights are so bright, you can't see the back. There's some way at the top. Um, how good is your heart? Can you run back up the stairs? I see a young woman back there in the, almost the last row who had her hand up. Yeah, faster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pipa. Um, I just wonder that while AI gives you a lot of auto-generation, you know, isn't there some sort of threat of stereotyping? For example, we are building AI-generated sifting processes for our recruitment portal, but what if we miss out on a Maya Angelou in that process, and how do we, like, counter that? 
This is a great question. And even without AI, I think there's been a real problem in HR for the last 25 years, which is we apply ever narrower filters. So we say the person has to be a college graduate, for example. Has to be a college graduate. I remember I talked to a law firm a while back, and they said, we're very diverse because we hire from five different universities. <laughs> I was like, OK, we have a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> one of the trends in the United States today is big corporations are increasingly saying, let's not hire college graduates. Let's hire 18-year-olds. Because an 18-year-old, then we can train them in what we need them to be able to do, which the universities are not doing. Um, and we can say, we'll pay for your college education, which you can do while you're working for us, but come work for us and we'll pay you cash and we'll pay for your university fees. Most 18-year-olds are like, this is cool. So they say yes. And you end up with a very different kind of thought process than someone who's been to university and has already decided kind of how things should be done. One thing I hear from a lot of chief executives, uh, which may be unfair, and it may be, now I'm probably gonna make a lot of enemies because probably a lot of young people in the audience, but a lot of leaders say, I get these people who've just come out of business school and they think their first job should be assistant to the chief executive and the second job should be chief executive. Uh, yeah, that's not gonna work. So, how, what are these filters? Why do we say, oh, you have to have this kind of background to do this kind of work? Is it true? So AI takes that filter process and just optimizes it. So now you get narrower and narrower pathways. And I guess you'll start to say, you know, we keep getting the same kind of people and they're just not cutting the mustard. Surprise, surprise, because it's easier to have the filter process, fewer interviews, but then you miss all the good stuff. So I think this needs a real rethink. And then again, how do we optimize the AI to look for the unusual? And maybe that's a key point to make right now. Um, do any of you guys remember Frank Zappa, musician? All the older people are like, yeah, Frank Zappa. He's like, Mick Jagger, he's huge. Yeah, you Google, anyway. So <laughs> Frank Zappa, this incredible guitarist, had this wonderful line where he said, all progress comes from deviating from the norm. If we stay in the norm, there's no progress. So right now, AI is basically trying to make us all fall into the norm. Think about your news feeds, right? Like how many of you actually have in your news feed somewhere the stories about space that I mentioned? Nobody? A few? Very few. Why? Because the algorithms and artificial intelligence are literally like sheepdog. And so they corral us into ever narrower intellectual pens because it's based on the assumption that you want more of what you look at. I once clicked on a Meghan Mar Markle article, like once. <laughs> that is constantly in my newsfeed now. I'm like, I didn't mean it. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. So click on a few things on space, and suddenly, boom, you're like, oh my god, there's so much happening in space. So this is a problem of how do we spend our days, part of our day needs to be devoted to fighting the algorithm, fighting the artificial intelligence, stopping the aperture of what we see from being ever smaller, and how do we widen it out so that we have a better understanding of the actual real landscape, not just of the world economy, but of the individual that we're interviewing for a role. So this is what I mean about bringing a creative angle to the efficiency that AI offers. Both have to go together, hand in hand. Are we done? Is that the time? One more question. We can do one yeah. more. Yeah. Okay, oh, there's one right in the front. You won't have to run this time. Oh, it's, you're a different guy. The other guy had the heart attack. Okay. <laughs> Making it easy for him. Um, quick, great presentation, thank, thank you. But do you think there can be an over-reliance on AI and actually lose creativity if you're using it all the time? Yes. And more than that, I think accidents are happening. So I can't prove this, but um, 
You notice we've been having a lot of accidents lately with rail collisions, trains having collisions. We've certainly seen with driverless cars that the driverless cars getting into accidents and stuff. Why? I think part of it is that AI and our focus on data, it is creating models of reality, but those models are not reality. And so there's a gap. So the problem is what I would call smoothing, the smoothing of the data. So as here's a practical example. Who discovered the hole in the ozone layer? Was it us, the Americans, who had the best supercomputers in all history, or the British, who only had pencil and paper? The British did. And the British, of course, were complaining at the time. They didn't have any modern technology, and they were competing with us, the Americans, who had all this modern technology. But because they were writing down every single data point by hand in pencil, they started to see there's this weird irregularity. Oh my gosh, there's a hole. The supercomputers saw all the outlying data as a thing to be dismissed because it smoothed the data. So we didn't see a hole. So think about that in modern life. How much is the AI smoothing the data and removing the outliers? And the Frank Zappas of this world, who created extraordinarily creative music, would have been dismissed as not relevant because it's too far out there. So yeah, here's another takeaway. Go far out there. Hang out with the people who are out there. Take the ideas that are out there and play with that, because otherwise we all end up in this very beige, grayish space. Like, you know, that color here in Britain people love to put on homes where you rent? It's like that, that color. Yeah, this is, we want to live in a colorful, beautiful, joyful world. Not that color, right? So that's my answer. And, and I don't want to you know, underplay this. The fight against these algorithms, the correlations they generate, the AI that is like a turbocharging of it, this is a big fight. It's a really big fight. Even in your own life, how do you widen the aperture on your Instagram, your social media? It takes time, it takes effort, but I think it's, it's essential if we're going to have true creative outcomes, which is what we humans are good at. So, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Pippa.